911, what's the location of your emergency? Yeah, uh, I live at 885 Yale Farm Road. Okay. I think I need an ambulance. Okay, what's going on? The truck fell on my stepson. The truck fell on your stepson? Yes, and we just got home, and I don't think he's alive. You don't think he's alive? No, 885. Okay. Okay, he's pinned, under, he's pinned underneath the uh, truck? Yeah, my husband's lifting up the truck. Honestly, I don't think he's alive. Okay, how old is your son? He's 22. And did the your husband get the truck off of him? He was stacking it up when I was just out there. Okay, are you with your, your son right now? <laughs> he's not alive. Is he, is he breathing? No. He is not breathing. Okay. No. Okay, we're going to start CPR, okay? Yeah, Carl, they want to start CPR. Do you know CPR? His chest is crushed. His chest is crushed? His chest is crushed? No. He, he's probably been under here for hours. Oh, my God. All right. What oh is God. your... What is your... Ma'am, what is your first name? Cindy. Cindy? C-I-N-D-Y. Okay. And your last name is Carlson? Carlson. Oh, my God. This is awful. On Thursday, 20th November 2008, Carl and Cindy Carlson returned to their farm in the town of Farrick, New York. The pair were already in a sombre mood, having just laid Cindy's aunt to rest that very same afternoon. Earlier that morning, Carl's 23-year-old son, Levi Carlson, had arrived at the farm. Levi was Carl's son from his first wife, Christina. Christina had also given Carl two daughters, Erin and Katie. That marriage had ended in tragedy 17 years earlier, when 30-year-old Christina Carlson lost her life in a house fire. Now, a cruel fate had once more befallen a member of the Carlson family. Levi had been summoned to the farm that day by his father. Carl had promised his son some cash in return for carrying out some minor repairs on his truck. When Carl and Cindy landed back at their farm roughly four hours after leaving Levi, a horrible scene greeted them. It appeared that the mechanical jack had given way while Levi was lying under the truck, causing the vehicle to collapse onto his chest and ultimately killing him. Paramedics rushed Levi to the hospital, but he was pronounced dead upon arrival. The investigation into Levi's death was nothing more than routine. A doctor's report stated that there was no need to perform an autopsy as the cause of death was obviously a result of the truck falling upon him. Shortly after Levi's death, Carl revealed to Cindy that he had taken out a life insurance policy on his son that was worth approximately $700,000. Cindy was stunned. When Carl went on to explain that he himself had driven Levi to the insurance broker, to open the policy just 17 days before his son's death, Cindy felt her blood run cold. Why would anybody want to take out a life insurance policy on a fit and healthy 23 year old? Carl explained that he had told Levi his job at a nearby glass factory was high risk and that there was a small but still considerable chance he could lose his life at work. Cindy wasn't buying it. The whole thing was just too coincidental. But could Carl really murder his own son for money? Just when Cindy was thinking that she was being absurd for even entertaining the idea that Levi's death was anything more than a tragic accident, she suddenly remembered a small detail from the day of Levi's death. As she and Carl had been about to drive off from the farm, Carl had suddenly stopped the car and got out. He told Cindy that he needed to give his son cash as payment for the job that he was doing, as in all probability, Levi would be gone by the time they got back. Cindy hadn't thought anything of it at the time, but now she was wondering whether Carl purposefully went back to the truck and pushed it on top of his son before they headed to her aunt's funeral. When Cindy discovered that Carl himself had paid the first premium on Levi's policy, her suspicions were only heightened. Carl also revealed that Levi had made him the sole beneficiary of his estate in his will. In the event of Levi's death, Carl was to be trusted with the insurance money, with the intention being 
that he would disperse the funds to Levi's daughters when they came of age. The day that this will was drawn up, November 20th, 2008, the same day that Levi died. For three whole years, Cindy put her concerns to the back of her mind. In the meantime, Carl went on a spending spree. He brought several new trucks, took Cindy on numerous luxury holidays, and started a somewhat bizarre new business that involved breeding ducks to be sold to local restaurants. However, Cindy struggled to shake off completely her suspicions that Carl had murdered Levi. She was naturally now starting to also question the nature of the fire that had taken the life of his first wife, Christina, back in 1991. Carl had also benefited financially in the immediate aftermath of Christina's death to the tune of $215,000. Then there was the other fire incident back in 2002 when the Carlsons born had burned down. Carl had owned several prized horses but one of them became limp. Shortly after the fire Carl collected an insurance payout of $80,000. Eventually in 2011 Cindy hired a private investigator to look into her husband. What the PA dug up would shake Cindy to her very core. Cindy was informed that Carl had recently taken out a life insurance policy on her. If she were to die, Carl would receive a staggering 1.2 million. In January of 2012, Cindy, in fear of her life, took her son Alex and fled the farm. She would spend the next year moving between hotel rooms and the homes of friends. Naturally, Cindy's family wanted answers as to what was going on between her and Carl. Cindy told most of her relatives that she and Carl were simply going through a rough patch in their marriage. However, she did confide in a cousin about her suspicions that Carl had murdered his son. That same cousin contacted the Seneca County Sheriff's Office in February 2012. Detectives looked into Carl's past and when they discovered that Carl's first wife had died under suspicious circumstances, they too suspected that Carl had been killing for money and that in all probability, Cindy was his next target. Concerned for her safety, detectives reached out to Cindy. When she arrived at the Sheriff's office, Cindy informed them that Carl had definitely murdered Levi and she could prove it. After moving out of the farm with their son Alex, Cindy had agreed to meet Carl at a local diner so that they could talk about their marital problems. During their meeting, Cindy informed Carl that the only way she would even begin to entertain the idea of getting back with him would be if he was totally upfront and honest about what exactly had happened to Levi. The two talked for a while and eventually Carl confirmed Cindy's suspicions and admitted to killing his own son. Cindy had recorded the entire conversation on her phone, but when she played the recording back for the officers, she was despondent to find that only her voice could be clearly heard. Carl's admission of guilt could not be picked up at all. However, the officers believed Cindy when she insisted that Carl had confessed to killing Levi. They asked Cindy if she would be willing to wear a wire and to try to get Carl to confess for a second time. Cindy was apprehensive, but she desperately wanted to see Levi receive justice. Can you just tell me how things went that day? So that I, I guess know in my head. Part of me feels like I'm walking into a booby trap. When I went in there, I jacked it up. And what? Then it's like. I asked you if you pushed the truck and you said yes. I, I didn't push the truck, I said. I said I had nothing to do, but I said I took advantage of the situation. Carl was leaving a restaurant in the town of Ovid a few days later when he was approached by Lieutenant John Clear and Detective Tom Crowley. They asked him to come down to the station for a chat. Carl agreed. Once there, the officers asked Carl to go over what had happened on the day that Levi died. Four years had by now passed since Levi's death, but Carl spoke with clarity. 
Okay. You guys don't know what happened that day. Tell us about it. The day that my son died. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Her and I, we had a funeral to go to. Left at 11.30, quarter 12, somewhere like that. It was on the other side of Sunny mm-hmm. Lake. Um, son was there. He helped me. We were working on the truck, changing the transmission lines, brake lines, the whole nine yard. You know, talked to him, said goodbye. He was going to work on his truck later in the mm-hmm. afternoon because he had to change something. I, don't, I can't remember what it was. So then we uh, left, come back a little after four. And went out there and found him. Did you say anything before you left? Just see you later and thanks or what? You know, I mean, just. So you had you gone know. out to the car with your wife, and then you went into the barn. Yep. Because okay. I forgot to give him the money. Did you give him the money? Yep. Fifty dollar bill. After letting Carl give his version of events, detectives did not waste any time in outright accusing him of pushing over the truck on purpose and killing Levi. What we know to be true is you pushed that car over. Right? I did you, not. Well, the only thing that remains to be found out is if, what the reasons were. Nobody could ever accuse Carl Carlson of being a rocket scientist, but he was not stupid enough to admit to killing his own son for the benefit of his family. No, you know, no. Here's I did. the thing, you confess to your wife, I lied Period. to my wife. Are you have her wired? And well, be honest with Yes, we do. I thought it's, you did. It's all recorded. You made difficult decisions, and the fact of the matter is, you did what most people would want to do, but don't have I, a I don't understand what you mean by that. What I mean by that is exactly what you told your wife. Your son, unfortunately, was flawed, like everybody else. He, 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 and just like you told your wife, on multiple times, that you did what you had to do, You took an opportunity to benefit your family. Despite his careful objections, Carl was still about to slip up when he said the following. You don't kill your son. You don't kill anybody for money. Listen, who said anything about money? What are you talking about? Of course, the detectives were well aware of the life insurance policy that Carl had cashed in on following Levi's death. But in the end, they didn't even have to mention it. At one point, Carl asked for a lawyer before backtracking. Ultimately, he would spend nine hours speaking to the two detectives with no attorney present. Detectives continued to press Carl. They made it clear that he had already confessed to his wife, that he had indeed pushed the truck onto Levi, and that his words were forever cemented. In the clandestine audio recording she had made, Carl struggled to find a suitable explanation as to why he had told his wife that Levi's death had been no accident. I know you guys want me to just throw my gut saying, oh, I pushed it over, I killed him, and I can't say that because I didn't. Although you have said that. I played the game with her. What's that game? The game is like, I wanted to, I, no, I, the game that I didn't understand what how did, she was. How did this game work out? You say it was a game. Tell me what's, what's the game. Carl was starting to feel the heat. Investigators took their foot off the paddle a little, doing their best to make Carl feel comfortable. The last thing they wanted was for him to ask for a lawyer. After telling the two detectives about his stint in the Air Force, Carl could not help but mention that he had met his first wife, Christina, while he was enlisted. Naturally, Carl had to tell his interrogators about the big move to California and the subsequent house fire that had taken her life. My wife had passed away and- I'm sorry to hear that. What was she ill? No, she died in a house fire. Christina and Carl had met in the early 1980s. Carl had been serving in the United States Air Force in North Dakota at the time. Christina was married to another airman then, but embarked upon a passionate affair with Carl. Eventually, Christina left her husband and remarried Carl. After leaving the Air Force, Carl moved to New York with his first wife. He found a job as a laborer at a stone quarry. At first, Carl and Christina were doing just fine, but within a few short years, Christina gave birth to two girls and a boy. All of a sudden, money became a real worry. When Christina's father, Art Alexander, offered his son-in-law a job at his air conditioning company, 
The Carlsons upped sticks and made the move to Murphy's, California in the late 1980s. Art Alexander even gave Carl a 10% stake in his business, and all of a sudden Carl's money worries had disappeared. But his insatiable greed remained unsated. After making the move to Murphy's, Carl purchased a house that sat isolated out in the woods. The home was in need of repairs, but he had plenty of spare cash now to spend on renovations. Life seemed to be just about perfect until the afternoon of New Year's Day 1991. While Christina was in the bath and the kids were taking a nap, a fire broke out in the house. Years later, Erin would recall waking up to the sound of her mother screaming and the sight of smoke creeping inside her bedroom. Erin and her sister didn't know what to do. Eventually, the window behind them shattered. Their father reached in and hoisted the girls out of the house and placed them in his pickup truck, saying that he was going back for their brother, Levi. As the girls waited in their father's truck, they could still hear their mother screaming for help. While Carl would successfully rescue Levi from the house, Christina lost her life in the blaze due to smoke inhalation. She was ultimately found in the bathtub with a wet cloth over her mouth. The following day, a devastated Art Alexander arrived at the house. He wanted to understand just how the tragedy had happened. Art was stunned to find that the window of the bathroom where his daughter had died was boarded up. Carl would later be vague about when and why he had removed the glass pane and boarded up the bathroom window with no fewer than 17 nails. But for Art, there could only possibly be one reason. His son-in-law had started the fire on purpose and murdered his daughter. When Art saw a pickaxe resting against a tree, he was certain that Carl had made absolutely no attempt whatsoever to save Christina from the fire. Carl's behaviour in the immediate aftermath of his wife's death was at times bizarre. When one of Christina's sisters asked if she could decide what to dress Christina's body in for her funeral, Carl replied that there was no point as Christina was, quote, a crispy critter. It is worth noting that Christina died from smoke inhalation and her body had not been touched at all by the flames. When asked if he had any idea how the fire might have started, Carl stated that a few days earlier, Christina had come into the house with a bucket filled with kerosene. The Carlsons used kerosene heaters in their home and according to Carl, the bucket had been knocked over by the family dog. Carl had cleaned the spill up, but in hindsight, he reckoned that residual amounts of kerosene embedded deep within the fabric of the carpet might have started the blaze. As to how the kerosene itself became ignited, Carl had an explanation for that also. According to him, on the day of the fire that took his wife's life, he had been working in the attic using a trouble light. Upon leaving the attic, he had set the light on the carpet before making his way to the garage. It was Carl's opinion that this trouble light had ignited the remnants of the kerosene and subsequently started the fire. Less than a week after losing his home and his wife, Carl took his three still grieving children and moved back to New York State, but not before collecting $215,000 from a life insurance policy that he had taken out on his wife. Well, I gotta ask, just because yeah. now that it's brought up. That's fine. What, uh, how, much you, how much was your insurance on your wife? Uh, 200 on her. I had I, there was insurance on all the kids. Um, it was a, you insured your kids. Yeah, the wife. You know, it was a little insurance policy on each kid. Okay. Because um, I had insurance on me when I was growing up. My parents put uh, on it. Well, you remember how Levi's? We talked Levi's insurance was taken out pretty soon, pretty much soon before his death. Was that scenario? No, it was farther than that. What's your, your just your deceased wife's name? Chris. Chris. So about how long before do you think? It's, it's Was it like in other people's minds, like relatively soon? It's gotta be, I don't know, it's gotta be. 
It's got to be like three, four months or something. Oh, okay. Like so it was a significant, well, actually, that's not a long time. So she was like three or four months, she's she's insured through your job, and then she the fire occurs? Right. Okay. I mean, and then... It's, it's striking. Believe me, you, if if anybody... Were you, were you thinking, like, I can't believe my, this is, how does this no, happen? No, I'm like... If, and my family, I, I'm, you know how some people go through life and no matter what happens, everything that can go wrong can go wrong. Detectives confronted Carl as to why the window of the bathroom was boarded up. Carl stated that the window being boarded up was irrelevant as it would have been too small for Christina to squeeze through anyway. You should have sued their asses off. Oh, and I, went, I had... Well, Wait, did you board it up? What's that? Did you board it up? Yeah, we had to because it was no good. But you couldn't fit out in. You couldn't put, you might be able to put a baby out of it. A baby. You and I are a 80 pound woman. There's no way. You could, you Why'd you board it up? Because it was all broken. The, the, everything the was shot. Broken? Oh yeah. You know, and it's like the frame was shot. The, the frame of the house was shot. And um, when did you board it up? Like eight months before. Carl's statement that he had boarded the window up eight months before the fire was a bare-faced lie. Christina's sister, Colette, had stayed with her and Carl just three weeks before the fire. She was able to state categorically that the bathroom window had been intact at the time of her stay. Also, as can be seen here, the aperture of the window was more than big enough for an adult to get through, especially if their life depended upon it. The two men hounding Carl had many cards up their sleeves and they would raise the issue of the window later in the interrogation. In the meantime, they confronted Carl with something that they were sure would knock him right off his perch. Do you know how accurate they can do with the cause of death based on body temperature and spirit temperature? I, all I know is what they tell me. The it's, it's accurate. Within What's three, 15, 25 minutes? Yeah, I imagine maybe. So about. there's a big problem. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking four and a half, maybe a little longer, because I know it was, it was after 11 o'clock when we left, I think. And we didn't get back till it was like right around, I think, 4.30 or so. Right in, you know. We revisited all those things mm -hmm. and all the, the things that were done at that mm -hmm. time of his death. We've sent them in to many places. They've been mm -hmm. in state police lab and Monroe County lab. And analysis has been done. They can <coughs> put it within a 15 minute window. Mm -hmm. It's not as precise as we would like it to be. But basically, or specifically, who was before he left? He died. Carl continued to insist that Levi had been alive and well when he and Cindy left the farm. More than seven hours into the interrogation, the two detectives once more asked Carl why he had confessed to killing Levi to his wife. Did you not tell them, Sydney, you admitted to pushing a truck over on your son? Yeah, to feed the, the furnace. Feed the furnace. Come on. Feed the furnace. Who would kill their kid? And then you think you're being set up, Carl. Why in God's name would you go in there and say that? It doesn't make sense. It Carl. Well, I'm just, I'm just. The two detectives continued to press Carl. A whopping eight hours into the interrogation, the pressure became too much for him to handle. Carl was by now claiming that Levi was indeed already dead before he and Cindy left the farm that day, but that he had failed to raise the alarm because he was so shocked. I did not kill him. What killed him? The truck. How did the truck kill him? It landed on him. And I had nothing to do with the truck landing on it. Now, stop and think a minute. Do you think that anybody's going to believe no. that you confessed to Cindy because you were playing a game with her and you left your son laying there dead because you were in shock for four and a half hours? Yeah. Do you think people are going to believe that? I No. No, they're not. So you don't you think you ought to but do the damage control here and start telling them what really happened? That's what happened. It's not what well, happened. It did. It did. It did not happen that way. There's no way. It did. I've been around a long time, Carl. Nobody does that. Can all right? See? Finally, Carl had had enough. His lies were going nowhere. 
and he knew it, but he wasn't ready to tell the whole truth just yet. I never heard him. You did. It's all right. I'll stand up for you. What are you going to do for me? I'm going to stand up and say this wasn't premeditated, cold-blooded murder. That it was just something that happened. Shit happens sometimes, Carl. That's what I'll do for you. Next. I opened the truck door. Okay. When they did. And if I had hit the box underneath it, it wouldn't have happened. Carl, what was an accident? Why did you try and hide it? You're very, you're very close, Carl. Come on. I didn't do it. <laughs> I think part of you did. May not all of you. No way. I didn't. There was nothing. <laughs> Man, you can do it. The detective's masterclass interrogation had finally paid dividends. Nine and a half hours after first shaking hands with Carl Carlson and asking him to have a seat, Detective John Clear entered the room to tell Carl that he was under arrest. Well, come with me. You're under arrest. I think you knew that was coming. Carl would ultimately be convicted of second degree murder in relation to Levi's death and he was sentenced to a mere 15 years. Detectives were outraged. They got straight to work on charging him with his wife's death and making sure that he would never see the light of day again. Back in 1991, the fire inspector who looked into Christina's death was suspicious of Carl's claim that a trouble light had ignited some kerosene. Carl Kent was able to state that the filament of the trouble light in question had not been energized at the time the fire broke out. In other words, the trouble light wasn't even on. When Carl moved to New York State just a few days after his wife's death, the fire inspector had asked his superiors to allow him to go and visit Carl to question him about the nature of the fire. When he was told that there was no money available for him to make the trip, the fire inspector made a point of retaining his notes on the case, something that would come back to haunt Carl Carlson when he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of his wife in March 2020. 